And then once I got in there, I was like, I literally can't. Like, there's no way to physically have one person who cares help an entire broken system. For sure. It's definitely something that we, the people, are going to have to step up and come together and force that change because they're obviously not going to do that on their own accord. Well, no, it's working exactly like they want it to work. Yeah. Real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let the show begin. Pretty sad and crazy. What's going on out there? <laughs> I know. And it's like so hidden too. Like nobody really knows until you're in it. Yeah, for sure. You have quite the following on TikTok. It just goes to show just how many people are being hurt and taken advantage of and just screwed by the system that's supposed to help them. Every once in a while, you'll get a couple people on like on live or that will comment. They'll just be like, everything you're saying is wrong. I'm like, I have 60,000 people behind me who are saying, help, I was a victim of this too. So it's like, how do you stop doing what you're doing? Absolutely. So is it mostly other people that work in the industry and such? Oh yeah. Then? Oh yeah. All the time. Just last week, I had a guy who had worked for like 10 years and then another guy who worked for five years and they were coming at me in my email saying that they were going to get me stripped of all my licenses and certifications. And I'm just like, okay, how are you going to do that? Oh, the threatening and retaliative behavior that they're being accused used of that they're denying. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, so this blackmail thing that I talk about all the time, you're you're doing that now? Okay. Yeah. Case okay. in point. Thank you. <laughs> And then after I refused to like give in to their little ego trip, one of them ended up being like, oh, by the way, you're like really attractive. It's like, hmm, oh, okay. Gosh. Should we go out for coffee? Talk about yeah. it and some crumpets and tea. They really wanted to get me on a Zoom call so they could just video attack me and tell me how wrong I am. Oh my Lord. Well, it's people like that too, that, you know, we can't change what we can't acknowledge. And even if they do happen to be some of the good ones, because I mean, not all of them are bad. You know, I mean, I've had a couple of, of run-ins with CPLs myself because my psycho ex constantly files false reports against me. And thankfully, I've never had any troubles with them. Of course, that was before I went through a lot of this stuff that I went through within the system. So had I already experienced that, my initial reaction with them may have been much different because I have the sense of mind where, look, I have nothing to hide. I may not be the best mom in the world, but I sure do try dang hard. And I think I'm doing a pretty dang good job. So mm -hmm. whatever, you know, I let them in, no problems, no complications. Fortunately, it went well, but uh, it's not always that case. Yeah, I try to tell people all the time. I'm like, look, I know not every caseworker is a bad caseworker. I don't think that I was a bad caseworker. I just think that the system is rigged against parents. It's not for parents. It's not for kids. It's rigged against them and it's for money. It's not for anything other than that. Absolutely. And I can't imagine it's any easier for the caseworkers that do want to make a difference and do the right thing. If you've got so many other people that are pressuring you into doing this or doing that. I got into it thinking that I could help kids and we had had a situation with my husband's brother where he ended up being strangled by his sister's boyfriend and it was just this whole situation and CPS got involved and they're like, really, there's nothing we can do. And so I wanted to get into the system to try and help kids like him who had been like completely neglected and fallen through the crack. And then once I got in there, I was like, I literally can't. Like, there's no way to physically have one person who cares help an entire broken system. For sure. It's definitely something that we, the people, are going to have to step up and come together and force that change because they're obviously not going to do that on their own accord. Well, no, it's working exactly like they want it to work. Yeah. You know, it's one bringing... thing that always baffled me and never made any sense is you see all the time these parents who 
are innocent, have their children taken away from them. But then on the flip side, you have these parents who are just absolutely terrible to their kids and they keep custody. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, that never made any sense to me. So what I like to tell people is that they don't want broken children. So children who are truly abused, when they come into foster care, they require more services, which means they require more money. So of course, they're going to want to send them back to their parents because they're not actually making the state any money because they require so many services. Whereas a child who goes into foster care and has parents who are perfectly fine, they're not going to require as many services. So the state gets more money for them. So it's just kind of like a turnabout thing. I'm trying a new podcast series that I'm calling Where's the Proof? I think a big problem with society and communities is that they recognize that it's a problem, but mm -hmm. I don't think most people have any clue just how big of a problem it is and just how serious it is unless they become victim to it. Yeah, it's like you assume that CPS is there to help children, so you don't want to step on their toes because there are children who are being abused, but at the same time, it's like it needs to have reform. Yeah, so one of the things that I noticed when I was going through those statistics for my first podcast I'm doing for that series, mm -hmm. I kind of started with explaining the laws like, okay, there's all this going on. So how big really is the problem? Let's take a look at what the law says. Let's look at some statistics to try to get a better idea of what's happening. So you go into the statistics of things that they have to put out every year and year after year, it's kids mostly from ages zero to four. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, that just makes zero sense how if, you know, all these families are being, you know, most families don't just have children within that age range. I found it really scary and odd that m the vast majority were so young. Yeah. And it's, it's because they <laughs> can't speak for themselves. And a lot of foster parents are in it. I mean, I'm not going to say a lot of foster parents, but some foster parents are in for foster to adopt. And so they want children who are in that zero to four age range because they believe that they will be less traumatized and have less trauma down the line. So they can like mold them into their own child versus actually working reunification with the parent. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was another thing that I noticed was that it's such a low percentage even had the initial plan of even attempting to reunite these kids. And it's like over like 600,000 families every year year get yeah. investigated by CPS. That's a lot of families. Mm -hmm. I see people all the time who are like, well, I've never had it happen. I'm like, then you're lucky. Like I worked for them and I had it happen to me. I ended up being investigated by them while I was working for them. If you get in with the wrong people and the wrong people want to get back at you, they can call a report on you. And that's what I don't think people understand. All you have to do is call the hotline and know basic information about someone and you can file a child abuse report on them. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the caseworkers that came over to my place at one time when my ex had filed a false report, I explained to her, I was like, well, I'm assuming this is where it's coming from. I know they're not allowed to disclose who, but she most certainly did not argue that point. And she repeatedly apologized. I'm sure she had the inclination that there was really no need for her to be here, but she's point blank told me, you know, somebody wants to get us involved. They know exactly what to say to make us have to get involved. Mm -hmm. I like to tell people all the time, when you read a report, when it comes on your desk, you know the basis of the report. You can just feel the way that the reporter told the hotline how it was meant to be perceived. They write down everything. So if your ex-husband, ex-wife is on the other end and they're just jabber, 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 the hotline is writing down everything. So we right. get this full narrative of what's going on. And so when we were able to read it, we were like, this is definitely a retaliation report. But because of the extreme allegations, we have to go out. But I would say probably 80% of the cases I worked were just nothing. It's always baffled me. I totally understand. It's a double-edged sword to where there are plenty of children and communities who do need that ability to be able to report something anonymously. But when you have so many that are taking advantage of that... How do you combat that? And then on top of that, it's illegal to file a false report, mm -hmm. but nothing is ever 
done about that either. So there's absolutely nothing in place to detour anybody from filing a false report. Yeah. And I think I honestly don't physically understand why a reporter should have to be anonymous. I don't because they're so protected already by the law. There should be no reason for them to have to remain anonymous. If you're seriously reporting child abuse and neglect, why would you want to be anonymous? Absolutely. I mean, you might have more information. You'd think that you would want somebody to be able to contact you to speak freely and gather all of the information that they can. And yeah, and yeah, like, and you're right. And it just goes to show that, you know, if you're not leaving your information, more than likely, you probably don't need to really be calling. Yeah, I feel like more often than not, every single time I got an anonymous reporter, it was the most ridiculous report I had ever read in my life. And so then you feel ridiculous when you have to go out and confront this family and be like, sorry, I know you don't have a meth lab in your basement, but <laughs> like, oh, sorry, I had to bring seven police officers with me. Maybe. The report said that you had like an active meth lab and were like trafficking kids. I can physically see that that's not the case, but it was even worse when you would get the people who would call in ridiculous reports in the middle of the night. Like I would have to get up at two in the morning for an emergency and go out there and the family would just be looking at me like, what are you doing? Mm. Same. I didn't want to get out of bed. <laughs> Oh, guys, it got to be horrifying and scary, too, for these kids to have, you know, somebody show up at their house any hour of the day and yeah, wake you up in the middle of the night to make sure you're OK. Like, I remember I had one case where someone got in a bar fight and we had to go because the person who got in the fight called on them. So I had to go to this house at like three in the morning when everybody was passed out, wasted, but like they had responsible adult there babysitting. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you have to wake up these kids like the report was that one of these kids was violently strangled i have to see this kid even though i could physically see this kid on the couch i'm like how do i know he's not laying there dead like and i can't touch him i can't whatever so i physically have them wake him up and it was awful oh, man and it was nothing like it was absolutely nothing it was a bs case there's some states that are starting to pass laws now that are requiring people to leave their information they're not allowing anymore yeah uh, so anonymous far, calls. Yeah, so so far Texas is the only state that's gotten it pushed through all the way. So you have to leave your information for reporting. Praying that catches on nationwide because it seriously needs to. We've got to start doing something to combat all these issues yeah. with. And I mean, I think that also DAs and sheriff's departments and police departments need to start taking more accountability for false reports. You guys write on the hotline website and on the hotline when you call, it tells you that filing a false report is a felony. So it's like, then why aren't we actually pressing charges when we find out it's so false? Exactly. I mean, it's not like it's a little known fact or, or anything. I mean, people are well aware, mm -hmm. but they're also well aware that it's not enforced. So, no. I mean, what what's it matter if they can just go ahead and do it and get away with it, then why not? Exactly. And so one thing that we had, I don't know if it's every state, but we could flag reports. So if it was like obviously false, we could flag it in the system. And then after like four or five flags, the hotline would get notified that this person is like a frequent reporter. But I mean, still, that's five reports that the person has to make before it's taken seriously. For sure. I mean, that's, it's a, such a terrifying experience. It's, it's scary, it's intimidating. It's annoying. You hope you have a good caseworker when it happens to you, but I'm going to say more often than not, half the caseworkers out there are going to write narratives about you that are not even true. People don't know their rights. They don't know how to stand up for themselves. In my eyes, telling a CPS worker to go away and get a warrant is making them do their job. It is not showing that you have anything to hide. Right. Right. Yeah, I think more people need to do that and, and, and recognize that. So that way that becomes the norm. There should be some laws put in place where CPS is not allowed to show up at your door unless they have a warrant. Even with the whole, you know, not reporting thing, that alone, it, your uh, constitutional rights are violated right from the beginning because you have the right to face your accuser. And mm -hmm. that right from the get-go, that right is stripped away from you. Yeah. And they, they just tell you like, well, technically your accuser is CPS. No, my accuser is whoever reported it. But you guys keep that a secret unless 
And it's only unless you're facing criminal charges. If you end up facing criminal charges, you can, in some cases, find out who the reporter was. You know, I've never seen any reports or statistics on that. You have any kind of idea on how many actually result in charges? I it, It's very few. I would say maybe 20%. And even then, if the charges stick, you know? Right. Right. So, like, I have three cases that haven't even gone to jury trial yet. I have a jury trial in April and a jury trial coming up here in March. It's been two years now, and those perpetrators have just been out walking, and they have serious charges. And it's like, they just get to walk around free. One of them has, like, 17 charges of child abuse and neglect. And the other one has homicide. So, it was my fatality that I worked. And that person was able to go out and have another baby oh my lord have mercy yeah she kills one kid and was able to get pregnant and have another baby and she's still not in prison lord it's awful it's so awful not only does that take a toll on you but then you just see how even more broken like i had a trial last week and the guy was facing like two counts of rape two counts of sodomy kidnapping and tampering with a witness and he got one year of prison suspended so he doesn't have to spend any time and two years probation that's it (laughs) what the hell yeah so i mean the way that we treat perpetrators in general regardless of what kind of violence or trauma they're inducing there's no accountability no because it's just like oh well we don't have room because we have a hundred people in jail for literally crimes that don't matter so we don't have room for these people so we can't actually punish them it's just so backwards (laughs) It's so backwards. Like you would think that they'd want to be more lenient on the nonviolent offenders and, you know, make room for the actual bad guys. Yeah, but it doesn't fit their narrative. That's when all these conspiracy theories get in where like they want people who abuse and sell drugs to go into prison because that's where the heavy drug trafficking is. So they keep drug abusers and drug sellers in prison. It's just continuing to move the product. Whereas if you get someone in there who doesn't know what they're doing, they're not going to have a player in their little chess game. They can't use it to make them money. Yeah, it's all about pawns. And we're all just pawns, which is terrible. Even when you can sit there and face the corruption that's going on, there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, the fact alone that any statistic that you look at, just I actually just, you know, looked into it for my recent podcast that I was doing and I knew the number was high, but I hadn't looked at the exact statistics in a while. And when I pulled it up, I I literally almost threw up. It was like 98% of all children who are rescued from sex trafficking had CPS involved in their lives somehow. Oh, rescued. <laughs> More like it just got bad enough that they had to do something about it. Like, I remember working a trafficking case. It was a clear trafficking case. You you look at this child and you're like, there's absolutely no way that this is not a trafficking case. And we had Homeland Security. We had the FBI all come down and interview this kid. And they were like, mm, we don't really have proof. And it was like clear. It was clear as day that you were you are now going to send that kid back into the exact situation you're trying to prevent. Mm -hmm. it's all all backwards and and pure corruption oh my gosh it is it is so then it's like how can i not speak out how can i not help parents who may have this happen and get completely taken advantage of i like to tell people people who are already abusing their children already know everything i'm saying Mm -hmm. and they're using it to their benefit what i'm trying to do is help parents who are not abusing their children who do not know their rights right The people who are then blindsided by CPS and have no idea what's going on. They don't know how a case works. They don't know how to do anything that's going to come out of their case. I don't have to tell parents who are abusing their kids what to do because they were probably abused children. They know how to hide it. And that's the worst part. That's why we need to turn our focus back on to parents who are abusing their children. Well, I mean, they've already got the laws in place. It's just a matter of getting the states to actually follow them. Mm-hmm. 
So then you look at the whole CPS system in general and how an average caseworker doesn't even last a year working wow. before they quit. So then you have such a high turnover, they're constantly having to dump money into training new caseworkers. They're having to dump money into constantly having the revolving door of caseworkers. It was traumatic being a caseworker. It was traumatic after being a caseworker and it continues to be traumatic every day after that. It doesn't go away for anybody. I can imagine that it, it would be an easy job regardless. I mean, even if everything did go smoothly and laws were followed, I can't imagine it would be, you know, a whole lot easier. But at least if you didn't have to worry about, you know, the awkwardness and uncomfortableness with allegations that, you know, are total crap and you know, something to lessen that a little bit, maybe. So if I have a fatality, I have to work that the same way that I would work a petty case. So it's like I am putting as much emotional energy into an, a fatality as I am like, a petty case. And right. that's what gets hard because you have 10 really petty cases. Like I had a case where I had to go and talk to the dad about farting in his kid's face. Oh my Lord, have mercy. The school reported it and said that this child was being abused. His dad was holding him down and farting in his face repeatedly. And I'm like, okay, like, what are you talking about? So I go out and talk to the dad and he's like, I've never done that. And then I go and I talk to the kid and he's like, that's not what I said. Oh my Lord. So then the school is technically protected because they're mandated reporters. So they're protected under that. Even if they fudge the truth, even if they make it this bigger story. And even if a kid tells me that didn't happen, I still have to go talk to the dad and tell him, well, please don't go fart in your kid's face. <laughs> That's just, I can't imagine even being in a position to have to approach something so ridiculous and minute when there are literally children losing their lives. So I even one time had to go and basically give the sex talk to two children because their parents wouldn't. So they were 14 years old and they were doing inappropriate things in the middle of class. And so I go and I'm talking to them and I'm like, do you understand why it's not appropriate to do this during class? And they're like, well, no, my mom or dad doesn't talk to me about it. So then I have to be the one to talk to them about it because I'm like, if you don't stop doing inappropriate things during class, you can become a sex offender. And then having to talk to a 14 year old boy and tell him, you know that she's saying that you did this against her will she could press charges on you and you could be held responsible as an adult and they just don't understand but parents would rather protect their children from that rather than tell them like hey this is how real life is and I think that's another thing that people need to stop trying to protect your kids from the harshness of the world because then when the harshness comes they're not going to be ready for it absolutely and it's gonna hit them that much more harshly as well yeah it is. Lord knows the world is crazy enough as it is without oh any conversations. And it just oh. seems to be getting worse, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, the longer it continues, the more power they feel they have. And I mean, they do. They have all the power. There's no accountability. There's no oversight. They can pretty much do whatever the want they want. It baffles me how, like you said, with the high turnover rates and such, imagine all the caseworkers out there who have had such little training or experience and they have just as much if not more authority than a judge yeah. who's had years of training and experience and it's like how could you give you know somebody that kind of power and authority with no oversight also no experience like what you're saying is so true like most of these caseworkers are fresh out of college with their four-year degree they don't have any kids they don't have any experience they've never had to deal with anything that traumatic and then you're basically throwing them into a situation and hoping that they succeed if they listen to their supervisor. Yeah. So then you're giving the supervisor all of the control, which is exactly what they want. As I remember when I did my job interview and I had asked what the turnover rate was and I was interviewing with like all of the supervisors and they told me, oh, we've all been here for years. Our turnover is so small. What they were talking about was the supervisor turnover. Yeah. <laughs> 
they didn't tell me the caseworker turnover. And when I walked in, we had three caseworkers walk out that day. Oh, my I, Lord. Yeah, our full team was eight investigators. And when I walked in, there were three of us. Wow. You know, and, and here's your sign. You know, I mean, and it's just like with any other job, I don't give a shit what job it is. If you've got problems like that with your employees, that means the problem starts at the top. Yeah. And uh, something needs to be done from the top for all of that to trickle down that way and it's like but it won't because it's working exactly how they want it to work yeah. they're like well why not train the worker bees to do what we want them to do and just keep the management how management works right well i'm sure they're i'm assuming that they are the ones that get all those financial incentives for all those kids that are being adopted out yeah which is so funny when people are like i never got a raise and i'm like you may not have noticed it you may not have recognized it as a bonus because it didn't feel that way. But I was talking with one of my other ex caseworkers and I was like, you know, whenever we would get payouts for like extra time, because so how it works is that they don't pay you overtime, you just get extra time. So if you work 10 hours over your like 80 hours, they just put it into a bank. And so then every once in a while, they'll pay you out some odd hours that you've accrued. But I asked her, I was like, did you ever do the math? Did you ever physically see your hours that you had somewhat worked overtime come to your bank and the math makes sense? And she was like, I never checked. It's like, okay, well, we have to pay them, but we have to make it not look sketchy. So we're going to say it's overtime because it's true. We all were so overworked. I would have been so grateful to have a raise. My salary did not cover my bills, you know? And so it was like, whenever you get a little bonus because it's your time, time that you feel that you've put in, you're like, oh, wow, I feel so grateful. You don't even think that it's like a kickback that's coming from removing kids. You don't feel that way at all. Well, I mean, or, if, if they're making it out to be, you know, something completely different, I assume there's a lot that have no clue that that's even you know, oh, how yeah. it works. Because then in their mind, they're like, well, no, I worked these hours. This is yeah. my money. And that's fair. I'm not going to hold that against you if you're going to turn a blind eye to it. I get it. Yeah. But you can't say it's not happening when you're not looking into it. You right, know? right. Yeah, you can't claim ignorance and then say, oh, well, there's no way it's happening because I don't know about it. That's yeah, and a lot really of people just, they want to turn a blind eye because they want to think that they're helping kids. And it's like, maybe yeah. you are, but the handful of five kids who you save in your five-year career, how many did you hurt? Absolutely. And are you just turning away from that because you helped this many? And I think that's the thing. I think about it a lot. Like, how many families did I harm while I was there? And, you know, I'm sure there's a handful. A handful that I had to do what I had to do in a situation. But for myself, I was like, I never blatantly lied on a report to have someone get press charges on. Or I never lied that someone said something that they didn't say. Or I never lied and said that I saw something in a house that I didn't see, but I'm one caseworker. I don't touch every case. And we were actually told from the get-go that we weren't <laughs> supposed to talk about our cases with other caseworkers because oh, wow. then it creates, it creates witnesses, you know? I talk with my neighbor caseworker about her cockroach-infested house and she tells me a detail. Well, in her narrative, the detail is different. I'm now a witness to her perjury. Right. So we were not supposed to talk about our cases with other caseworkers. We weren't supposed to go out with other caseworkers to their home visits. There were special instances where it would be like a dangerous situation. So you would have like a partner go out with you, but very, very slim. Right, they yeah, would be like, oh, go ask the sheriff. Right. And it's so scary that they have this so meticulously set up with the intention of literally kidnapping, essentially kidnapping children from their families. Oh, yeah, like 700 children go missing in foster care every year. And that's oh. just in one state, you know, like that's just that are reported. And then what's even worse is that in some of these states, when a foster child goes missing, they have to continue paying that foster placement for that kid, even though they're not there, so that the foster placement will hold the bed. Wow. So how do you know that the foster parent didn't like traffic them out somewhere and then right. just continuing getting money for them? Behind yeah, got the money scenes. from selling them off and then gets money from the government for a job well done, I suppose, huh? Yeah, all they have to do is submit a missing child report. And what is that, 10 minutes on a rainy day that you call? Horrifying. 
It is. It's awful. Every kid I've talked to who's been in foster care has been traumatized in some way. No one has a good experience in foster care at mm. all. Well, I mean, kids don't want to be taken away from their parents, generally speaking. I mean, unless there's, you know, true abuse. But even then, you got Stockholm Syndrome, where, you know, that's all those well, kids have ever known. And that's kind of how I explain it to people. This child doesn't know that abuse isn't normal. That is their everyday. They are not going to notice that that's not normal until they're put into a situation that's normal. And for most of these kids, they're taken out of abusive homes and then put into foster homes where they're equally abused because the foster parents know that they don't know any different. Oh, your parents withheld food from you? Well, I'm going to withhold food from you too and just tell you that that's how things are. So the abuse continues, but now it's strange instead of people who are your parents right and like so easy to continue that trend if they already know well that's what they're used to they ain't gonna know any different they ain't gonna know any better and it sucks because people are like oh my gosh that's so sick i would never think that and i'm like okay that's fine you don't have to think it but there are hundreds of foster parents who are investigated just as equally as regular parents And the foster parents' cases get swept under the rug way more often. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I noticed that about there was some statistics in particular that I looked at that were like, oh, the vast majority of abuse comes from parents. There's very, very little with adoption. It's like, yeah, bullshit. You know, just the amount of survivors alone that have filed complaints lets you know that's BS. Yeah, and it's like, I remember working a case on a foster parent parent. And so we had basically internal affairs. So a caseworker who's working normal investigations isn't supposed to look at foster care investigations. They're worked separately, which I think is weird. But then also, I remember having to fill out a safety plan with this foster mom because she had like eight kids in her house and one of them was sleeping on a bean bag. Their house was completely hoarded out. Like it was ridiculous. And we didn't even remove the kids. We were like, just clean your house. Lord. Like, and- Probably no follow-up enforcement either. (laughs) Well, no, it was just like, oh, we'll have the licensing people come out and recheck your house in like 30 days. It's just sad how there's so little accountability and so little help. And so, you know, all of these agencies were formed specifically to fix a problem. And they not only don't fix anything, they make things exponentially worse. Well, and it's so funny when you say that because... Because the whole CPS system was not even created for this. So it was actually created for children who were orphaned. Really? And yeah. So it, the Child Protective Services was supposed to help place children who had been orphaned. That was it. Mm-hmm. And so over time, when you have children who have been placed... Like, how else are you going to make the money? Well, then you turn, well, maybe we should be looking into parents who are abusing their children. So they actually molded it into something that it was actually never created for. Huh. So, like, we have Title IV funding through Social Security for this Child Protective Services that is supposed to place displaced children who have been orphaned. And now we've turned it into, well, we can get funding for them if we place them in foster care. So it's all about the cash grab now. Oh, but yeah. Yeah. It was never Thanks, intended Clinton. for children. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Like, but it yeah. was never intended for abused children ever. That's so crazy. I've n- I've never heard of that. Yeah. I did a deep dive on the history when I was starting my TikTok just to see like where it all started. And it didn't even happen that long ago. Like it was only like the 70s or something mm. that it happened. Like it hasn't been around that long and it's already so corrupt. Oh, That's yeah. That's what's crazy. You know, it's obviously all the statistics very clearly show that vast majority of sex trafficking stems from that. And, you know, this fully 100% believes this goes all the way to the top. And what I mean by that is the White House top. You know, oh, like, I mean, there's no possible way that we can have these massive problems on such a grand scale nationwide where the government agencies are involved, family courts are involved, police officers are involved. And I mean, that's that's some serious corruption that goes yeah, but it, far higher than what people think. And there's no way, there is truly really no way to get out of it. So it's like, you have to protect yourself from it because it's too deep. If you speak against it, they're just going to silence you. If you try your hardest to combat the corruption, you will 
will be silenced because you're one person when they have a million behind them. Oh, for sure. For sure. And all that money and power and authority. Oh, yeah. And all that runs so deep. They have attorneys on their sides and judges, so they only have to make one phone call and then they have like a warrant out for your arrest for something that never even happened, but they have 10 witnesses to corroborate it. It's crazy. People are looking at it so under a microscope when it's so much bigger than that. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, with, with the way that things are set up, there's a limited amount of possibilities even. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's only so many things that it could possibly be so it's just it's shameful that more people aren't standing up and speaking out against it and you know the more people that you know come you know folks like you who they recognize it's wrong and they speak out against it and then it just it's so much that it makes you stop and think my god how many sick twisted people are there out there that could give a shit less about children like, I mean, if we don't have no. a heart for children, then there's no, no hope, you know? Exactly. When everything was going on in Arkansas for the in vitro fertilization stuff, their senator said it the best. He said, we want more children. We need more children. And what they're saying that for is to be worker bees, to supply the economy, to send them to public school, to brainwash them, to get them to work the system exactly how they want it to work. Fill up all those factory position jobs. and Yeah, so it's like, do they work. care? Do they care about children? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, I would say that the government cares about as much as children as they care about women. It's like, unless you're a white male in this society, Society, go on get out there's nothing you can provide for us <laughs> yeah like we'll use you and abuse you until you're done which is crazy because it's like those are kids and you know you think about the titanic and how when they were all jumping off the boat they would say women and children first women and children first so it's like they created this narrative in our brains that women and children are so valuable but then what happened when they got off the boat and onto the island. They were forgotten. And that's how it is. The face of women and children are so important, so valuable. We need them to survive. We need them to move forward. But the second they're in trouble, the second their rights are infringed upon, the second they need something, who are you? <laughs> Sorry, we don't have time for all that nonsense. That doesn't fit our propaganda that we need to push to exactly. you know, get elected or get more money or get more power. I've already got that now. No more need for you. Yes, exactly. It's like, well, you're not really fitting into where I need you now. You don't really fit the puzzle. Exactly. And it's just so crazy to watch it. Like from my own experience with the court process, I had a man who beat and raped me for six miserable years before I could get saved. Three years later, he takes me to court because he got upset with me because I helped his one of his more recent victims get safe. And, you know, just going through the system and going through the motions and just seeing how little they care and how, I mean, they just victimize you all over again without a second thought whatsoever. Oh, and they drag it out too. They make it continue to traumatize you. They bring you back for one questioning and then a couple months later when you're finally feeling like you can heal you're being questioned again and they do the same thing in cps the same exact thing when you feel like you can finally move forward or you know your kids aren't asking every day if a random person is going to come take them then all of a sudden they're back mm -hmm. there has to be something different cps is doing way more harm than they are doing good and are there families that need intervention 100 percent, but we're missing them they're falling exactly. through the cracks there's no well, they're one not making them money <laughs> Yeah. Well, and there's no money. one to see them. It's like I said before, the abused parents know how to hide it. They're not sending their kids to school with black eyes. They're getting doctor's notes so that their kids don't have to go to school. They're not sending their kids to school hungry. They'll feed them right before they go to school so that in that kid's mind, they were just fed. You well, know, they know like, exactly how to work and play the system and they do it oh, yeah. very well. It's when the kid gets fed up, honestly. So I worked a case with a family and I had talked to them seven times in my time there and 
the eighth time the kid was finally like, I'm ready. I'm done. I'm done protecting my mom. I'm sick of it. Because every time we went out, I was like, there's nothing I can do unless you talk to me, buddy. There's nothing I can do unless you talk to me. And he would just be like, I can't. And I can't force him to. Right. Well, I can't imagine he, you know, it's got to be hard for a child in a position like that to feel like they can trust somebody. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, so at that point, his mom was using him for drug tests, like would have him pee for her drug tests. And he was like, I think nine. And he was the one responsible for taking care of his three younger siblings. And his biggest thing was, if you take me out of my home, I can't keep my siblings safe anymore. Yeah. Whereas if I'm home, I know they're here and I can protect them from mom. It's not a big deal. But if you remove us, what if we get separated? Well, it's no different than, you know, a, a domestic violence situation where there are thousands of moms that stay in abusive mm -hmm. relationships because they know whole damn well that court isn't going to help them keep their kids safe if they leave and try to get full custody to break the cycle and keep that child safe. They courts have zero interest. There's no money in that. Well, and they've already made up their mind that you're just going to go back to him. The kids are just going to be not safe. So we'll just take your kid we'll make money off of them and you can just go live a miserable life by yourself right. figure it out on your own Mm -hmm. That's um, awful. Oh, yeah. I went back several times just because of that fact. When they're given overnight unsupervised visitation and your child comes back to you the next day having staring seizures and that's horrifying. You know? Yeah, you're like, I'm better off just being there. I can protect yeah. them if I'm there. Absolutely. Yeah. I Absolutely. get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. It's really heartbreaking and hopefully something will change soon. Something has got to give. And I've noticed, and I'm I'm really happy and I'm really grateful. I've noticed that nationwide parents are just getting to the point where they are fed up and they are pissed off and you know Good. just gung ho. Good. Like there's been a, I've I've noticed there's a lot of cases going into courts now where they're you know making it a point to look, they're violating my rights. And, you know, and I pray to. that continues. Yes, I do too. I you know, it's what we need. It's what we yeah. need. Absolutely. I mean, not even not just for parents, but for children's sake as mm -hmm. well. They don't deserve to have to go through that torment. No, they don't. It's just more trauma. Exactly. Life's hard enough as it is. They got to survive school for 12 years, you know? Yeah. Well, oh. Thank you for having me yeah. on. It was great. I love talking with you. We've got to do so much this again sometime. Yes, definitely. I really love to eventually do something where we kind of go over different statistics together oh, yeah. and such. And That'd be kind so of point fun. out, look, people, this is happening. Wake up, type sort of thing. Yeah, so that's my cool. goal right now with Humanity Against Violence is bringing true awareness. I mean, there's a big difference between people knowing something is happening and for people to know exactly what's truly happening. And exactly. I think that until we can accomplish that, we're not going to get anywhere because we don't have enough people backing us up and supporting us. Exactly. So hopefully we can uh, all work together and accomplish that and kick some ass. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you again. And I look forward to working with you later in the future. Perfect. Amazing. We'll get back to your little ones and have a spectacular day. You too. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.